So when uh, Patrick asked me to come and participate in this session, he said it was a training program, and I expected a classroom with about 25 or so people gathered around a whiteboard, and I thought I would do what I prefer to do for this kind of talk, which is to sort of construct the biological system and see what its components and properties are uh, with a chalk talk. But obviously, that's not going to work here. Uh, and so I will try to explain as much of the, the, the anatomical structure and its physiological function uh, as I can through slides. Um, there's a sort of an infinite amount of detail that one could go into. And I've picked some of the things that I thought might be of interest or relevance perhaps to people doing biomimetic design. Uh, but uh, we can focus on whatever we want. We'll get through as much as we can. And if there are questions, please interrupt and we can have a discussion because I'm not that familiar with your background or how much of the biological material will be uh, familiar or, or new. And so the title that I provided was What Roboticists Need to Know About Neuromusculoskeletal Systems, which I noticed got transmuted in what you have to know. Um, and the question is, why do you need to know any of this, or do you? And I think the answer relies on uh, to what extent you think that the biological system offers useful lessons that should be imitated uh, in the design of robots. And I was particularly intrigued to see that after having uh, come up with some of the most sophisticated compliant controls of rigid robots, uh, the group at DLR is now putting in exactly the kinds of things that cause biological systems to have certain desirable but certain undesirable properties. And I think we'll, we'll talk about uh, some of, uh, of those features in the biological system and leave it to you to decide whether they are, uh, they certainly seem to be useful for biological systems to do what biological systems uh, need to do to survive. Whether those are the same things that robots need to do to succeed is an interesting question. So I'm going to skip through those things. So the main, uh, one of the main lessons that we need to know on the actuator side, which I will talk about first, is that muscle is not the same as torque motor, which you all know, and we'll talk about some of the ways in which it is not. Um, but this talk is really going to have two major sections. The first part about the actuators and some of their properties, and then secondly, about how the control systems are uh, arranged uh, to deal with those properties. And so we'll be looking at the musculoskeletal system. Uh, it's controlled by the neurons, which are in the spinal cord. Um, and then uh, the properties of the muscles and their intrinsic properties are a very important part of, of biological controls, advantages and disadvantages. And then on the control side, we'll be looking at, at the feedback systems, the sensors that are present in the muscles, in the tendons that provide the equivalent of force uh, position and, and force feedback, um, and how those are wired in the nervous system, which is not like a traditional servo control system. So on the actuator properties, there, as I said, are a very large number of, of details that we could talk about. Um, and uh, I'm going to start with a couple that are, that are of relevance at the gross musculoskeletal level, and then we'll go back and take a look at some of the intrinsic properties of muscle. And uh, probably not too much detail, uh, we'll mention really only in passing uh, some of, 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 of these properties, which are really emergent aspects of the way in which one uses uh, the, the intrinsic properties of muscle. Uh, the sort of an overwhelm, overlying uh, notion is that there's this very complicated system of specializations that occur in muscle. And a lot of this is because it, incurs, it occur, produces some particular uh, competitive advantage. Uh, for animals, most of their mass and most of their energy budget is in muscle. And animals have to evolve. And so if there is a better way to do it for occupying some ecological niche, then that's been discovered over the millions and millions of years of evolution. And so we have layer upon layer upon layer of intrinsic properties and adjusting mechanisms for making the system as competitive as, as possible. Now, uh, at the very, one of the uh, important things that one hears relatively little about, but it's a very large effect, is the fact that the moment arms of the muscles, uh, of course, have to be multiplied by whatever force the muscle is generating to generate torques. 
And we'll talk a lot about how the forces being generated by muscle follow these complex nonlinear rules. But whatever those forces are, they have to be multiplied by moment arms, and the moment arms can be at least as, as complicated. Uh, one can certainly see how the moments would change uh, because of a, an arrangement in which a, a tendon inserts across a, 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 a joint at a fixed location on a limb segment, and then as the angle changes, you can see that the angle uh, that the distance between the muscle path and the center of the joint, which is the moment arm, uh, can change. And so for a muscle which is an elbow flexor, in this case the brachioradialis, uh, you can see that the moment changes quite substantially over the working uh, angles uh, that, uh, of the joint uh, from a large moment to a small moment, for instance. And everybody is quite familiar with the fact that, that there are certain positions at which you can get more torque out of your muscles, um, and, and that's partly because of the muscle properties and partially because of the moment arm properties. Uh, what people often uh, don't consider is that most of these muscles actually cross additional joints. So even what you appears to be a simple elbow flexor, because of the way it ends on the forearm, is capable of producing, in fact, this is the main muscles for producing pronation and supination, which is essentially another joint in series with the elbow flexion extension hinge joint. And because of the way in which the insertions occur on the muscle of the, the bones of the forearm, the moment in supination pronation in this direction uh, is a, an, a substantially more complex function of the angles. Both the angles in supination pronation have an effect on what the moment arm is in that axis, but also a very strong effect um, in, the, in the elbow angle on how that affects the supination pronation. And in fact, uh, for, for muscles, you can often find uh, a, a reversal of the moment in certain extreme positions. So you can't even say for certainty that the muscle will exert the same direction of torque um, on, uh, say, a distal joint that it's crossing. This is also quite true of the ankle. That, and it, these joint angle dependencies of, of moment uh, are often in a direction which tends to be sta stabilizing, which of course is good. Uh, they are, uh, the, the moment arm tends to be largest uh, e either in the center range of the motion so that you can avoid having large torques when you get at, uh, at extremes, or they tend to reverse sign in such a way that they pull towards the center position and can be used to stiffen the system uh, at some neutral orientation. Now, so one you know, sort of quick thing to keep in mind. Another one is that the connective tissues of the body in general are nonlinear springs, and this is a fundamental property of the collagen, the protein that makes up the connective tissue. It has to do with the way in which the filaments of collagen are arranged. Um, but even more important is the fact that the operating conditions of those connective tissues are constantly being modified by what are called trophic factors, and this is true actually in general of the properties of musculoskeletal systems, that they are adjusted according to their patterns of use, or in the case of the uh, connective tissues such as the collagen, their strength will be adjusted to their peak load, and their operating uh, length will be adjusted to the ranges in that the system has experienced as, in, as sort of its central operating point. So the system is constantly optimizing its working parameters uh, around whatever the operating conditions happen to be. Um, so this is one of the few pictures of muscle that actually correctly reflects the real structure of muscle. Uh, Muscle has, in addition to the muscle fibers that everybody pays attention to, uh, a great deal of connective tissue. Uh, 
Uh, so this is why you pay a lot more for one steak than another. It depends on how much connective tissue there is in the muscle. Muscle is, is meat is, is, is muscle. And the chewability comes from all of the distributed connective tissue, the collagen, which is wrapped around all of the muscle fibers and very important to its function. In this case, the connective tissue that wraps around all of the muscle fibers and is essentially in parallel with the contractile elements is what's responsible for the passive force of muscle, the tendency of muscle to act like a spring as you get to extremes of length. And that spring is a nonlinear spring, so if we look at the passive forces of various muscles, uh, what we see are springs that take that they become slack at short lengths and then around some other length tend to uh, increase their forces in a nonlinear way as the length of the muscle fascicle increases. And one important, uh, the reason that you see two sets of curves here is that in one case, uh, I have normalized the force length properties to the optimal length of the fascicle for the active force generation. The active force generation is, of course, achieved by the myofilament structures, the interdigitating proteins that actually generate force. And there is in an element of the myofilament structure which has a passive spring-like property that keeps the system from, for instance, falling apart at extreme lengths. It keeps uh, the registration of the myofilaments uh, within the muscle fiber even when the overlap between the thick and thin filaments has disappeared. Um, and that does give rise to passive tension. And so you'd expect the passive tension then to scale to this optimal overlap. Uh, but you see here that for a given muscle, there seems to be a lot of variability in individuals. These are uh, uh, the, the passive force length curves for different muscles in, in uh, different cat specimens. Uh, and this shows uh, one of the hamstring muscles of the, the frog, which seems to be at a very different level. And the reason is that, in fact, for the mammalian system, most of the passive tension arises not from the myofilaments inside the muscle fiber, but from this connective tissue on the outside, which is adjusted according to the conditions of use. So if you renormalize these according to the maximum fascicle length that can occur at the anatomical limits of the motion uh, of the joint, then you find everything converges to a much more orderly pattern. What this means, of course, is that these individuals had different amounts of of parallel elasticity in muscles. And that probably reflects the different degrees of limberness that these animals had as a result of the way they were using their muscles. If you want to uh, reach over and touch your toes, uh, some of you can do that, some of you can't. If you want to do it, uh, you have to do a great deal of stretching to gradually lengthen the connective tissue. You're actually adding more collagen in series uh, so that you have a wider range of use. And you can do that independently of the active contractile properties of the muscle. A similar set of properties occurs in the series elastic components. So in addition, in addition to the, the contractile elements and their parallel elasticity, the contractile elements by and large end on tendons, which then link to the bone. And those tendons have compliance. And that compliance has a similar property because it's made of collagen, the same fundamental nonlinear elastic component. Um, one of the things that people often assume is that most of the length of a muscle is the muscle fibers and that the tendon is then relatively short. Tendon is relatively stiff. The maximum, uh, the, the maximum strain that you get from tendon under biological loading conditions is about 5%. So it would seem like it's relatively weak as a spring. However, there are two reasons why it's important. First of all, the actual length of the, of the connective tissue in series with the muscle fibers uh, can be uh, quite a bit longer than you appreciate. And I think I have a picture, yes, not very good. If you look at most muscles where you see the sort of uh, fusiform shape of the muscle, the muscle fibers are by and large not going all the way along the length of it. They're tilted at an angle which is known as pinnation or like the, like the fronds on a feather. And they are in series with connective tissue over substantial parts of their length in addition to the tendon. Uh, 
So the muscle fiber that's in here has serious elastic tissue at, at this end and this end, which is often substantially longer than the contractile element. So that 5% strain uh, can actually become a, a very substantial uh, energy storage mechanism uh, because it represents a substantial percentage of the working length uh, of the muscle. Let me just go back. Okay. So... So let's talk a little bit more about the properties of muscle once you look at its active force generation. And so we know that muscle changes its force generating capability based on the interdigitation of the fibers. And so we expect to see that the muscle, as it gets both shorter and, uh, let me get here, um, so as the muscle gets uh, shorter, uh, its force generating capability goes down at a isometric condition, that is when the velocity is zero. And it reaches an active force maximum here and actually tends, the active force tends to go down here. But it's just about at that point where the parallel elastic element, that other connective tissue around the muscle fibers, uh, kicks in and produces then the passive elastic force uh, that causes the system to act spring-like over the whole of its range. But remember that the height of the force here, which is dominated by the active component, that's what's under control of the nervous system. And so that can be scaled up and down depending on how hard the muscle fibers are being driven and how many of the muscle fibers are active. The passive tension is there all the time, whether the muscles are on or off, and it occurs at the longer lengths. So one of the things that we were talking about last night is whether there's actually a, a negative slope region that occurs in here. And for various reasons, it probably occurs not at all or rather rarely under biological conditions. You can see, though, that at, over the sort of range of operation, that this slope is fairly flat. And so muscle, by and large, operates under conditions where its force length properties are not a huge determinant. And so, therefore, uh, not a big factor of how the, the contractile element itself acts spring-like. What's really important is a very steep slope region that occurs right around the zero velocity. So when muscles start to shorten at a progressively larger velocity for any length that they happen to be at, there's a, a steep slope in which their force goes down uh, and asymptotes at some level uh, of several uh, rest lengths per second uh, where, the where the force generation uh, goes to zero. Uh, in fact, not asymptotically. There's a distinct intercept for different muscle fibers um, and we can talk about why that is. Uh, one of the important conditions of, of muscle is that it's often not just doing positive work, but in many situations absorbing uh, external forces and doing negative work. And so muscles are frequently operating in this part of the curve, and that's actually a slightly steeper slope on the positive direction and then plateaus. But So in this region around isometric, which is, of course, an important control space for any sort of postural stability, uh, these are the steep slopes that really govern the f force generating property abilities of, of, of muscle uh, as a function really of velocity. So let's look a bit about the mechanisms that give rise to that. So as I was saying, the contractile elements are these overlapping myofilaments. Uh, the filaments have these uh, little projections, which are the actual force generating components. And those generate force when their binding sites on the thin filaments are available. We'll talk about how that arises. Um, and so you can see that the number of these potentially force generating cross bridges that can be made depends on how much overlap there is between the structures that have these heads and the thin filaments that they could bind to. So as the muscle becomes substantially shorter, the thin filaments start to overlap with each other uh, and interfere with the stereochemistry of these cross bridges binding. Uh, as you can see that as that overlaps with this, um, there'll be binding sites here that are actually pointing in the wrong direction. Uh, you can't generate contractile forces uh, by connecting to that thin filament, for instance, only to this thin filament. 
Uh, and eventually, as the system gets highly compressed, the thick filaments will be pushed up against a structural band, a plate of connective tissue that keeps all of this stuff aligned across the, the cross-section of the fiber. And of course, on the lengthening side, it's quite simple to see that there'll be progressively less and less overlap between the thick and thin filaments, and so many of these cross bridges then will no longer be in a position to contribute to force. That accounts then for the force length property. The force velocity property comes from the fact that the cross bridges, when they first make contact, they generate a certain amount of contractile force. And as they gradually stroke the thin filaments past them, the cross bridge relieves the stored chemical energy the, uh, that is present as, 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 a, as a cocked spring. So it's generating force. And when the available mechanical energy in the spring reaches zero, then the cross bridge can detach. Uh, but at that point, it actually requires an energy-containing molecule, ATP, to bind with the cross bridge and enable the release and cause a recocking. So the system is re immediately capable of reattaching. So when the cross bridge first detaches, it's in its maximum normal force-generating capability. And so the faster the cross bridges are cycling, the more larger percentage of their time they're spending at the tail end of their active force generating range. So if you want to know what the total force is, it's essentially the integral of the force uh, as a function of the cross bridge angle and the probability distribution function of cross bridges at various angles, which depends on how quickly they're, they're recycling. On the lengthening side, if you actually attach a cross bridge and try to pull the myofilaments apart in the backwards direction, it takes more energy to rupture the cross bridges. And so the cross bridges are torn off, and that accounts for why the force goes up at the lengthening velocities. Uh, but because the cross bridges have not completed their cycle, they remain in the cocked high energy state, and they can immediately reattach and produce the same amount of force. So the probability di distribution of cross bridge angles now shifts in a positive direction and then plateaus at very, very high velocities because you're just attaching and pulling uh, the cross bridges um, off consistently. And that has a lot to do with energy consumption, which we'll get into in, in a minute. So, a couple of other complicated things that happen in muscle, which um, some of which is, is useful for energy uh, conservation, some of which is useful as a contractile property. Uh, one of the things that people often forget is that this force-length relationship, which just involves this interdigitation of the muscle fibers, um, and has this sort of shape, um, with the peak at the optimal uh, fiber length, um, that curve is actually quite dependent on the frequency of firing of the muscle fibers. There's no reason to see why it should be, because once you've established the overlap between the myofilaments, you've essentially established which cross bridges potentially could be made. Uh, but the way in which the cross bridges are enabled to attach depends on the release of calcium. So let's go back to this mechanism here. So this is now these thin filaments that the cross bridges are going to attach to, and they have binding sites. If we look at this in a blown up configuration here, uh, there's a control protein called tropomyosin, which is, in, which is sort of woven along the, the helical structure of the, uh, of the polyactin, which makes up the thin filament. And when calcium is present on a control point uh, on this tropomyosin called, uh, called troponin, it causes a shift in the axis of the wrapping of the uh, tropomyosin and allows these binding sites to be exposed or not exposed. So when calcium is present, the binding sites are available and you can get cross bridge formation. When calcium has been pumped out of the uh, sarcoplasm, the, the, the fluid that makes up the inside of the muscle fiber, uh, then the muscle is in a relaxed state because the cross bridges have no binding sites. Um, and so 
the question then becomes how many of the binding sites are available, and that depends on how much calcium was released and where it's released from. So the calcium uh, is sequestered in a set of uh, vacuoles, another part of the structure of muscle that's often ignored. It's sequestered in these little cisterns, little pockets, uh, and when the electrical activity comes along on, uh, on the muscle fiber, uh, it causes the release of calcium from these local sites, and then the calcium has to diffuse amongst the filaments. Um, and it turns out that the calcium cistern release sites are all located in about this position here. As the muscle is stretched, they tend to stay with this structure here. And so as the stretching occurs, the distance over which the calcium has to diffuse uh, to reach the sites at which uh, to, to expose all of these binding sites uh, is, is changing. And that has an effect then on the relative force length relationship. So that if you have flooded the system with calcium, uh, you get what is sort of the expected relationship uh, because all the binding sites are available. But if you activate the muscle fibers at lower frequencies, so the amount of calcium release is insufficient to activate all of the binding sites, the calcium is being sucked by, back up by the uptake mechanism as fast as it's released, uh, then you don't have, the, the calcium cannot diffuse uh, as equally and you get this shift in what the optimal length is. Uh, out to longer lengths where most of the available cross bridges binding sites uh, are closest to where the calcium is actually released from. This is another one of the reasons why muscle in general doesn't have this negative region of instability that you might have expected. Uh, it's because the force length curve is actually shifted out to a longer length where the passive tension of the muscle uh, starts to take up. Uh, at the operating frequencies. So this, these lower frequencies, around 10 pulses per second, are more characteristic of where the muscle actually spends its time operating uh, than the highest frequencies at which one often characterizes it. Now, another thing that happens is uh, that the muscles uh, don't generate the same amount of force at all times. Uh, so uh, any of you who play a sport like golf or tennis, know that when you get out there, the first thing you do is you take a bunch of practice shots. And you will have noticed that the first few of your shots are wildly unpredictable. And so people say, well, we have to warm up. What does warm up mean? Um, what actually happens is that you change the operation of the muscles, particularly the fast twitch muscles, which are responsible for athletic performance, where you need to generate high forces at high velocities, uh, those muscles, when they're resting, have a force length curve that looks like this. Um, and after you've warmed them up, it takes about eight or 10 sort of maximal voluntary activations to get them into this state, which is a much more ideal state with a much flatter curve uh, near the, the region where you expect to have the peak and much more force generating capability. This is, you know, this is the absolute increase in force that occurs um, when the muscles go from this sort of quiescent state to this warmed up state. Um, and there are also substantial changes in the timing. In the potentiated state, you can generate force in the muscle substantially faster if you put in uh, an, an, a, a sudden train of activation. Um, and uh, it decays as fast, but it actually tends to last, outlast slightly uh, the time of activation. So the system is sort of warmed up into a state that produces more forces and faster forces and, and longer lasting forces. Uh, and of course, if your motor program is based on it being in this condition, uh, sorry, in this condition, because that's where you spend most of your time exercising, uh, then when you first start out in this condition, you're gonna be very surprised by the results you get. Um, we, there, there are some hand-waving reasons for why it will sit in this reason, in this region, and, and they have to do with the fact that it's probably more efficient, even though it's much less controllable. Uh, and you don't actually get it into this state until you're sure you need it, uh, because it's expensive. Uh, how does that state arise? So 
One of the things that's often forgotten about muscle is, so this is a detail of uh, the, the myosin, and these are the heads that actually generate the contractile force. They're mounted to the central axis of the thick filament on these little lever arms that can, be, uh, can sit at various angles. Why is that important? Well, so muscle fibers, since they're filled with fluid, are essentially a constant volume structure. If they're going to lengthen, then they have to get smaller in cross-sectional area. If they get smaller in cross-sectional area, then the, the lattice of thick and thin filaments that are in sort of a hexagonal packing is getting tighter together at longer lengths and wider apart at shorter lengths. And so if you look at the, the lattice structure here, so now we're looking in cross-section of this, um, at the longest lengths that the muscle can actively generate force, um, you see that the distance between the thick filaments and the thin filaments is barely, in fact, slightly smaller than the actual stereochemical size of the, of, of the heads themselves. When the muscle is substantially shorter, and in fact near its optimal working length, uh, the distance between the thick and thin filaments is much greater. Now, the ability of the cross bridges to attach depends on how close they are to the attachment site to start with. Once the attachment sites are exposed, you just have some sort of thermodynamic motion uh, to sort of find the site, get a binding, um, and, and generate force. And so if the resting position of this system is with these chains held closely to the central axis, uh, then in this position, uh, these bindings will be less likely to occur because the heads, instead of sitting here, will be sitting uh, much closer in as they would be sitting uh, at the longer lengths. And so what happens uh, when you potentiate the muscle is you actually cause a conformation change in this angle uh, so that the system sits out in, in a more favorable position. And of course, what you can imagine that doing is a, is a substantial change to the force length relationship because now the system will operate best around the middle length, whereas in the unpotentiated state, it operates best at the longest length. And here's uh, this curve. You see the, the, the dispotentiated state where the cross bridges are sitting in tight gives you the best force generating capabilities uh, at long lengths and uh, rather poor force generating capabilities at what's supposed to be the optimal length. So, another set of complexities. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the energetics of this system because that's probably the most important thing uh, for the, the whole survival of the animal. Uh, Warm-blooded animals especially basically compete on the basis of spending less energy than they get when they seek food. Uh, so, Anything you can do that makes the overall system uh, more energetically efficient is a good idea, but you can't, of course, put the performance of the system at risk. And basically, speed costs. The faster you want the system to operate, the more energy consumption it's going to have. And what you find is a huge number of mechanisms that are designed to specialize organisms for this trade-off between uh, their ability to generate rapid movements or to rapidly modulate the force generating capability of their muscle uh, without consuming excessive energy. So we can see that there are basically two energy uh, consuming conditions that you would want to control and they have different effects on the system. Uh, one is obviously the energy consuming step of actually uh, generating the contractile forces and doing positive work. And that's the, the, chain, the storage of mechanical energy in the heads, the release of that mechanical energy, and then the restoration of, and therefore the consumption of chemical energy uh, to, to rebind and recock the, the heads. Um, the other of, is the energy consumption that's associated with releasing, uh, with, with act, causing the binding sites to become available. And this inv involves the release of calcium, which is down a concentration gradient, so that doesn't cost you anything. What costs you is pulling the calcium back out. You have to pump it back into the cisterns and get as close to zero concentration of calcium in the, in, in the fluid as, as possible. Otherwise, you're going to have residual connections amongst the cross bridges, and you won't be able to completely relax the muscle. Uh, 
so there's this competition between uh, the calcium release rates and the calcium up uptake rates. And so we can think of the energy consumption uh, as, as being divided up into these two different steps. Um, and then we also have to uh, deal with the fact that there are a number of energy buffers that can be used to generate uh, high levels of, uh, of work under short-term conditions uh, at the cost of an energy deficit that then has to be replaced afterwards. So that's why, you know, after you play tennis for a couple of hours, you find yourself breathing harder and, uh, and feeling warmer for a, a couple of hours after you've stopped the activity because you are replacing some of the stored energy that was consumed uh, at, at a rate faster than you could actually regenerate it metabolically uh, during the exercise. So we've incorporated all of these complex terms and several others that I haven't mentioned and that you probably don't even want to hear about um, into sort of all of the emergent properties of the muscle uh, in a system we call virtual muscle. And this is part of the software suite that I will demonstrate this afternoon for those of you who are interested. Um, lots and lots of these complicated properties and interactive terms that occur between the activation and the uh, force length and force velocity properties. Um, because this model has been generated with components that relate to the physiological processes and structures that are present, we can start assigning energy costs uh, to the individual term. And those energy costs can actually be scaled then to the conditions of use for a wide range of activation levels and, and lengths and velocities uh, so that we can get an accurate assessment of how much energy costs are for using the muscles under those conditions. Now, remember that you have what people say is a larger number of muscles than you need to generate any given torque at a joint. You have, in addition to muscles that just cross the joint, you have muscles that cross multiple joints. And so by arranging the recruitment of which muscles at which time, uh, one can juggle the energy costs uh, of the system, for instance, by so, so one of the most common of these is, uh, say, during locomotion, where as I'm walking, I have to make reciprocal movements at two adjacent joints. So I generally have to make movements at the hip and knee that are out of phase in a way that I'm actually transferring momentum from one segment across the segment to a more proximal segment or vice versa. So, for instance, as I'm, <clears throat> as, as I'm uh, walking this way, I need to pick up the leg here at the same time that I'm bringing the thigh forward. And so if I have a, a biarticular muscle that's arranged this way, you can see that it operates something like a pantograph. Uh, and so if I can just make that particular linkage stiff, it effectively can transfer momentum uh, from one segment to another across these two linked joints. And similarly, at the end of the swing phase, when I need to capture the forward kinetic energy uh, of the system uh, in the leg, I have to get the forward motion of the foot to zero. So I'm going to need to break this forward motion, but I also need to start accelerating the hip backwards. And so by, again, stiffening this biarticular muscle at that point, uh, I can efficiently transfer momentum from one joint to the other, whereas if I just had monarticular muscles, I would have to absorb the excess of kinetic energy as negative work in this muscle, dissipated as heat, and I would have to do positive work in this uh, muscle, uh, which would also cost me energy. And so a lot of <coughs> these terms for where the energy is consumed um, need to be considered in figuring out which muscles should be used at which time in a complex system that has that variety of linkages. So one way to look at this is to think about how the muscle performs depending on its velocity condition, which is probably the most important uh, sort of range of, of, of control variables for, for a lot of movements. So as we said, the force generating capability of the muscle around zero velocity uh, tends to have the steepest slope. It rapidly declines for increasing velocities of shortening, and it has this 
plateau, but with a very steep slope up to it uh, as the muscle fibers are lengthening. And this is for a range of activation levels in the muscle. The activation uh, causes two things to occur. One is that as you increase the activation, you increase the number of muscle fibers that are participating. Uh, and the other is that you increase the firing rates of those muscle fibers that have already been recruited. And you also do so in an orderly manner. So muscles are generally composed of a mix of fiber types that actually have different physiological properties, slow twitch and fast twitch. Where, uh, and, and you're already familiar with that if you ever uh, carve a, a chicken or, or a turkey and you ask light meat or dark meat, what you're really talking about is fast twitch muscle and slow twitch muscle, which have visibly different properties uh, as in terms of their color and, and quite different physiology and energy consumption. So this is the basic sort of range of forces that you get. And let's look at the energetics that it costs you to activate the muscle at 20% level as a function of, of the velocity. And you might think, well, I've rather uncleverly chosen this scale so that you can hardly see anything about the energy consumption uh, for this muscle uh, at the 20% level. Uh, when we go to the 40% level, we start to see a little bit more of a signal there. We get to 60% there, 80% and 100%. You can see that generating these higher force levels uh, has a very large energy cost. Um, and furthermore, that energy cost is almost opposite to the force generation. So because of the fact that the cross bridges are only consuming energy uh, when they're operating in the shortening direction, it's the shortening velocities that are generating relatively low forces, but very high energy consumptions. I've divided the energy consumption into two sets of terms. One, the energy consumption associated with the cross bridges, and the other, the energy consumption, and energy consumption associated with the calcium uh, release and reuptake. And of course, that does not depend on velocity, and it tends to be uh, a fraction of uh, which shifts substantially. So you can see that when you are in the shortening direction, the energy consumption related to the calcium pumping is a relatively low part of the energy budget. Uh, but as soon as you get slightly past the zero condition in the lengthening uh, velocities, uh, it becomes essentially all of the energy consumption. And we can play a little bit with this in, and see how it works out in, in reality in the muscle models this afternoon. So there's the total energy consumption and you can, as a function of the activation and velocity. So you can see uh, lots of reasons why, if you possibly can, to operate your muscles around here, uh, where they generate a lot of force and consume very little energy. <clears throat> and this, uh, and so, so this is the model has been validated for dynamic conditions. You can actually uh, ask a subject to do a sort of maximum voluntary exercise where they're extending the knee under highly dynamic conditions of recruitment and velocity. Um, and, and then uh, make a model of what the muscles uh, should be doing if they're generating the maximum force at this uh, activity and actually see the energy consumption that's measured over time and model the predicted energy consumption uh, for this muscle and get surprisingly good matches. Uh, so this would be the energy consumption uh, that's related to the actual work of the task and then this is that delayed recovery over a, a period of uh, several minutes, uh, which ref reflects this uh, metabolic debt that's incurred uh, when you're doing maximum effort exercise. So how do some of these sort of complex intrinsic properties play out in terms of the ability to use the muscles to, for instance, create a sort of useful impedance state at the end point? Um, so, in the case of elbow and shoulder, we can produce a sort of simplified model of the known uh, monarticular and biarticular muscles. Um, and this idealized system has monarticular elbow uh, flexors and extensors and shoulder flexor and extensors, and then these biarticular muscles as well. And in this model, we'll indicate uh, how strong a particular muscle's activity is by just the size of the symbol. And in this case, we're asking how could you control the position of the arm if there were a sudden impulsive force acting in various directions? Um, and so, you know, coming from Los Angeles, it's natural to think about how you would stabilize your arm if you were firing a gun. And so, 
if you're shooting this way or this way or this way, of course, you're going to get different impulse directions. The important thing is that it's a very brief, sharp impulse to the hand, and it's so fast that it would not be possible to use reflexes to adjust the posture. The reflexes have a loop delay time of at least 60 milliseconds, and pretty much the whole movement's going to be over and done with. So that's just in the loop delay time of conduction, and then there's about another 50 to 100 milliseconds of rise time and changing the force level of the muscle. Uh, so that becomes uh, a limiting factor. The only thing you can do under those circumstances is to sort of pre-activate muscles and hope that the intrinsic properties of, of those muscles, their uh, components of how their force changes instantaneously when their length or velocity changes, uh, will help to stabilize the limb.